is on a new. Ada, you can go on, please. Okay. Good day and welcome everybody to our webinar today on <clears throat> how to be a successful failure. Um, I know a lot of people are probably thinking, wow, that's a very catching um, um, phrase, but we're going to definitely dive into it today. Um, I would like to welcome everybody who's joining us today um, on this webinar. Um, of course, I would like to welcome our WMCF family, World Missions Christian Fellowship in Torrance, California. I would also like to welcome here the ministers of the Black Fellowship of SoCal Network of the Assemblies of God and members of their congregation who are also here as well. Um, I would also like to welcome any Vanguard University students who are present. And of course, I would like to welcome the Holy Spirit into a mist. It's going to be a fun packed um, webinar today. Um, today with me, I have Dr. Ed Westbrook, who's going to be speaking to us and filling us with a lot of knowledge, um, you know, about how to be a successful failure. Um, Dr. Ed Westbrook comes to us with a very impressive resume. He has over 40 years of legal and business experience, including serving at Vanguard University in a variety of roles. Um, in addition to his numerous businesses and entrepreneurial ventures, he was a founder and shareholder of Capital Bank San Juan Capistrano. He's also served as a judge pro tem for over 10 years in South Orange County and in the Harbor Courts as well. He is currently a principal and general counsel of a real estate development company with over a mil billion dollars in assets. He's also very active in his community, serving on the board of directors of various charities. And he has a broad wealth of experience, and we're very glad to have him here. Welcome to our webinar, Dr. Ed. Thank you, Ada. Yes. So we are going to be diving deep into this, like I talked about. And I think today, you know, this webinar promises to inspire folks, regardless of what age you are, whether you are young, whether you are old, to be successful. We can all be successful regardless of our age or past failures. And we hope to dig into this and to find out what steps any one of us could take at any time in our lives to get to and achieve those goals. Um, our, the main objectives of the seminar is to inspire people to set realistic goals. Um, and no matter what age they are, whatever the circumstances, God can help them improve their financial future. And also, hopefully, we get some actionable items and things that we could do right now to get started, no matter where you are, no matter where you fall in, to move forward starting today to achieve that um, successful journey for yourself or for your family. So I wanted to get started here by asking Dr. Ed how to become a successful failure. Why that, why that phrase, <laughs> a sure. successful failure? Well, this <laughs> is a... Um... This is a talk I used to give to seniors at Vanguard University on how to be a successful failure. Mm -hmm. uh, when they were graduating, um, I just wanted to talk to them, get them thinking about their financial future. And the reason I had named it this is because I had uh, five of my own financial goals. And uh, when I was in my 40s, I, I can't really see the screen, so I don't know if it's being shared or not. But um, uh, I had five financial goals in my 40s. And then when I got to be around 50 years of age, I realized that I was not going to be able to reach all of those goals. I was going to fail. Um, I wasn't going to get, I wasn't going to be able to get all of my five financial goals. So um, I could, I realized I was going to be able to, to do any four of them, but I wasn't going to be able to do all five of them. So I did decided to start sharing with students that, you know, I had those five goals. I wanted to retire at 55. I wanted to 
you know, have $8,000 a month in income, that's from everything, social security, pension, savings, whatever. I didn't want to have any debt. I wanted to live by the beach and I wanted my children to graduate from college with no debt in a car. And I knew, you know, if I didn't live by the beach, I could have the other ones. If I, you know, wanted to make less, I could have the other one and so on and so forth. But um, so I, I just named myself a successful failure because in the end, uh, by having some goals, I was be able I was able to um, do better than if I had no goals. So I right. just wanted to encourage them to uh, to set some goals. So yes, yeah, that's very awesome. No, I think that's that's an eye catcher. Anybody once I saw that, I was like, yeah, I want to learn more about this because how do you be a successful failure? So no, that definitely did the job. So I wanted to ask you then. So what would you say, or how would you define success? for yourself and to our audience as well. I mean, I know it, it, it will vary for different people, but for yourself, how would you start out to define that? Well, okay, and, I, and I'm gonna confine myself when I talk about success to financial success, because financial obviously success. Yeah. there's a lot more things important in life than finances and family and your relationship with God and, mm -hmm. and all of those things. But um, I think people maybe, they might be listening today because they're more interested in, in the financial aspect of it. So right. for me, it was, I was looking for financial independence. Um, I wasn't necessarily trying to become rich or a mega millionaire. I wanted to, I just wanted to be able to um, provide for myself for my entire life. And I was kind of thinking as, a, a, I, I think of my body as a machine. And, and so when, when that machine is working, um, you know, and I, and I can turn that wheel, then money comes out. And every month I was thinking to myself, well, you know, for 40 years, basically from age, say 20 to 65 in round numbers, um, I was going to be able to work and produce money. But at the end of the day, there was going to be a day when I didn't have the strength or the desire to keep turning that wheel and money right. was going to stop. So I decided that I needed to um, you know, think about that. I, I have a favorite painting. It's a picture of a ship that's going up a, up a river. And it's actually a famous ship in British history. They, they won a lot of battles, but you can see it's a ship that has sails and it's being towed with now at the, it was done right at the turn of the century. Uh, and it's being towed by a steamship. Well, that ship eventually uh, was great in its day, but you know, it didn't work anymore. And that's kind of what I'm what I'm thinking is, OK, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I'm, if I was going to be in financially independent, defining success for me would be to be able to to not have to rely on somebody else to pay my bills. And I wouldn't have to ask my children. I wouldn't, you know, have to to be um, uh, I, I was able to, to by planning ahead mm -hmm. while I'm working, I can put money aside so that when I quit working, there will be money there to uh, to pay my bills awesome so that was my very uh, pretty basic uh success for me would yeah it's not not that that high so <laughs> no i think that's perfect i mean that's you know being able to pay your bills not a lot of people can <laughs> sometimes you know do that right now so i think that's a that's a success um in itself um, um, I just wanted to remind our audience here that we have a Q&A function, and if you have any questions that you want to, um, Professor Ed to answer, feel free to put it in that, and we'll get it to him. So um, one thing I wanted to um, ask, because uh, is you say the key to success is to set low goals. Yeah. Um, can you expand on this? A lot of people, you know, when you say low goals, what do you mean by setting low goals? Can we expand on on that as, as a key to success, yeah. Yeah, part of that language is really, um, I, you could say achievable goals. In other words, okay. if, if you're 50 years old and you don't have any money in savings and you have a, a middle income job, um, the setting a goal to be, you know, save a million dollars in the next 15 years is probably not a realistic thing. So a lot of people go, well, I can't, save a million dollars, I'm not doing anything. But what I'm saying is uh, set a goal that you can achieve and uh, set a realistic goal 
and don't be afraid, you know, to, if you set low goals, you'll make them. So yeah, that's, and I did want to, I did want to add one other thing when I'm talking about financial independence for myself, I'm actually obviously talking about my wife as well. Um, you know, 11 times more frequently wives will outlive their husbands. So I wanted to make sure if something should happen to me that my wife um, would, would not be uh, without too. So it was, it was really planned for both of us. Yes, that's um, definitely a part of it. Um, um, I definitely think what you just said right now resonates in terms of, you know, those achievable goals, goals that are, you know, um, measurable, like they will tell you, right? Um, right. Are the types of goals to set, to, to be able to look back and say, or look forward and say, I met this goal. So yeah, I know the low, low is um, synonymous with, like you said, um, 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 measurable goals and goals that are achievable. So I like that. And I think that's something that um, even young people could relate to right now is sometimes we set lofty goals or really high goals where you're like, you're in, you're in college right now. Is that a goal that you could achieve at this point? Right. You know, and I think a lot of people don't, you know, they set themselves up that way instead of just looking at where they are and kind of working with what they what they have currently. You know, so I, you. I've heard uh, it said, and I and I really believe it's true, that people often overestimate what they can do in one year, but they underestimate what they can do or three or five years. And um, so maybe if we have time near the end of the broadcast, I would really like to talk a little bit more about goal setting and how to do that in some ideas I have definite things and uh, we we'll have time to talk about that but I, I appreciate the, the question yes definitely okay and so now I just wanted to dive a little into prepping um I know you talked about you know how do we prepare how what are the steps that we could take to prepare for our future to be able to meet these goals that we have or to be able to ensure we have a successful future a future where we're you know we're good what are the steps um, sure. that a young person could take or anybody, regardless of where they are in life? But some people might be trying to start out now. <laughs> and I don't think there's any, you know, there's any um, late time. It's never too late. Let me put it that way. So what steps would you say have helped you or you've seen that will work to, to get to where we need to go? Well, I think you start off with, I, I look at, uh, you know, as financial uh security kind of as a four-legged chair okay mm -hmm. so i you first of all you start off and you say well you know what am i going to need well you know at some point even at any stage of life you, you need some affordable housing you have to have a roof over your head reliable transportation you don't want your car breaking down you won't be able to get to work or whatever you need a steady income and you need some adequate savings for some hiccups in uh in life or a few extras so I went and I, first of all, I decided, well, how much would I need? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of a, um, you know, a moving target. Not everybody's going to have the same goals. For me, I set $800,000, which is roughly $100,000 a year, just because I thought, well, you know, with inflation and everyone, everything else, that's, that would just be a number. I just said, that I'm going to try and do that. But this is kind of, where you have, uh, according to the uh, Bureau of, of Labor Statistics, um, they say the average person gets Social Security of $1,700 a month. So if you have two people, if it's a married couple, that's about $3,400. Um, and there's a 4% rule says if for every $240,000 of savings, you can probably get $1,000 worth of uh, per, per month in retirement income. And so I said, well, $500,000 in a savings on IRA individual retirement account, plus your social security, you're going to get anywhere from, uh, you know, around $65,000 as a couple. If you go to a million, you get 90,000. So this, this breaks it down. You'll see a lot of people are living on 80%, 80, oh, almost 90% of their income is social security. Mm -hmm. That's not very much. Yeah. And, um, you know, you have to kind of decide uh, where you want to go on that. But so I just kind of picked a number of a million dollars since that was a round number. And, and then people can adjust it. Some people want to do better than that. But 
Let's right. let's see it. When I asked her question, how much money would if I'm a 21 year old college graduate have to save every month to to retire as a millionaire? And I'm retiring, saying it's 65, retiring, quit working full time. All right, and it's pretty it's pretty um, low actually. If you go and you look and and just look at a schedule, if you're assuming that if you put money in a what's called a, a tax deferred account, you don't have to put this, even if you get 7% every year, if you start at age 20, you only need about $204 per month um, in order to save that. And when you're 65, you'll have a million dollars. So um, obviously, the longer that you uh, the that you save, the younger you start, you're better, uh, you know, because you've got compound interest working for you. Right. So, so uh, mm-hmm. yeah. So, you know, if you, if, if you can save the first 10 years, if you can save $200, that'll save you so much money, $200 a month. And if you think, you know, if you, whatever you do, you, you got to start somewhere, but you start getting in your head that you're going to try and save $200 a month. And um, if you're 30, you have to, you have to bump it up and you can see, you know, if you're 40 years of age, you have to save a thousand dollars a month if you want to if you want to uh, have a million dollars when you retire. So awesome. That's kind of when you retire. I, I just kind of put something up there. Um, if I have a magic of compound interest, which is called the rule of 72, and I just put this little thing up here, I thought people might be willing to to look at it. The rule of 72 just says how many years to double my money. So you take 72 divided by the interest rate. So if I'm getting 8% interest, my, my money will double every nine years. So go to the next slide on the, the magic of compound interest. You can see if I have at 8%, at 29, I have 1,000. Nine years later, I have 2,000. Nine years later, I have four, so on and so forth. And that's how if you end up uh, compounding every nine years, whatever you have will double. And you can see um, that's only with the thousand dollars. So, right. if, you know, starting early is the key. Is really starting early is the key. Yeah, we yeah. have some questions coming through, sure. um, but before we go into that, I just want to ask. I know you say starting early is key. What age would you would you say would be the best age to start? Whenever you step, you know, obviously, I mean, when people start working when they're 18 and over, well, most people at adulthood when they're 18 and up, but um, what would be a good age? And also, is it advisable for parents to start already having these plans for their children too as well? Well, I think um, for me, um, I felt as a parent, I wanted to give my children an education so mm-hmm. that they could... Um, you know, live their own lives and do their own financial planning. I feel like my my job I could save for their education, but um, I'm gonna let them save for their own retirement. I'm I need to save for my retirement. Yeah. So um, <laughs> yeah. So you know, I told kids in college. I said, you know what? Uh, right now you're in college. You you're really you need to get an education. You're you're working part time. You're just you know trying to get through school. Right. I would say you start when you get your first job. Yeah. When okay. you first get your first job. Then, then you're starting getting a regular paycheck. Then you pay yourself first and you put, you say, look, I, I need to put $200 aside. Now I'm going to put the 200. I need to, to give to the Lord. I say, actually first, we, we know we give to the Lord first, but then after what's left over, then I, I put aside 200 and then I figure out how to spend the rest. If you, if you do it the opposite way around and say, I'm going to pay all my bills. And then when I'm done, I'm going to save some money, there's never anything left over. So yeah, I found that you just kind of have to reverse that order. Yeah. But um, kind of like the live on 80% and save 10%, give to the Lord 10% rule, right? Yeah. Um, I, I I guess that's my recipe for financial <laughs> success is you know you give 10%, you save 10% and you live on 80%. 80%. And um okay. and that's that's kind of where where we end up. But yeah. then how how do we get there is, is hopefully I can give you a a few pointers on maybe the how part of it. I think um, I think the difficult part sometimes is well, okay, how do I do that? I have a lot of bills, I have obligations, and, yes. and things are tough. And 
how do I, how do I find a way to get that $200 a month? Or maybe it's $500 a month if I'm 40 years of age and I haven't started yet. I need to start now. Um, so that's maybe what we can talk about a little bit. Yeah. Too. Yeah. And I think that's tough. But before we go there, I just wanted to um, ask this question that's in the that's coming in our Q&A. It says, what are your thoughts about passive income towards achieving financial independence? Well, passive income, and, and that's really what we're talking about. Passive income is where you don't have to work for it. Right. So um, that's where we're really saying we're talking about saving while I'm working so that I I do not have to, uh, I can live off that passive income. And again, like I said, for every 200, let's just say $240,000 I save, I can get about $1,000 a month in passive income. Mm -hmm. the, the rule is they usually, they want you to think about withdrawing 4% of your savings towards income every month mm -hmm. after you retire. So um, yeah. anyway, that's, that's, that's really important. Because I think if you go back, I think I have um, like something about, you know, well, where's that money going to come from? You're really going to come from savings. It's going to come from your, from your investments, and it's going to come from Social Security. Um, those are the areas that you're going to have your income coming to you. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for that response. So just going back to what you said about, you know, people having so much to tussle with and so much bills and so much. And they're thinking, how am I going to do this? Um, there's a lot of people who are leaving paycheck to paycheck, right? In this right. day and age. And they want to start, they want to achieve financial independence. They want to be successful, but it's, it just seems so out of their reach. Um, what would be a key vital thing that you would say to them to do now okay. in order to start moving? So I asked the question, who will pay for my retirement? Right. Okay. So, all right. So how am I going to do this? Most companies have some type of a 401k, which is a, a, a government program that you can put money in savings. It's not taxed, or you have, you can open up an IRA individual retirement account. And so if you do that, um, you don't have to pay taxes on that money. So if I, take $200 and put it into a, a retirement account or a 401k, then I'm not taxed on that money. So it's that's really uh, an advantage to me. And a lot of companies also match at least, you know, some percentage, 3%, 5%. So if, if I put in of my paycheck, if I'm making, um, if I'm making, let's say, um, $4,000 a, a month, and they that's they will put in like two hundred dollars for me, so I can put in two hundred dollars. They're put in two hundred dollars. So you, the first thing you do is you you start some type of tax deferred account. That's that's a really key thing. And then I also have talked to people, especially younger people, about what kind of financial decision will decide if you're a millionaire or not. And um, it's usually when somebody gets out of school, they've been driving a beat up car for a long time, and maybe it's not the most reliable, they want to get something. And I think, you know, getting a reliable car is important, but maybe the car they want is not the car they can afford is and still put away $200 a month. So that first decision that they make, oftentimes will determine if they're a millionaire, if they get a car, where they can put away $200 a month, uh, we have a name for those people. And th th that name is they're called millionaires. And mm -hmm. the people that don't put away $200 a month, they, they just won't have as, as what they need. Now, what happens though? I mean, I, I'm talking about younger people. There's a lot of people out there. And even myself at age 40, I realized I had not really saved as much as I should have at that point. So what do I do if I'm, if I'm 40 and um, I don't, I haven't really prepared. Well, what if I just start saving $500 a month? You know, I'd still end up with a quarter of a million dollars at age 65, even if I do five. So that's a lot better than having nothing. And so I think at any age, a person can start. A lot of times they really start thinking about it. When people are young, they think, oh, you know, 
that's never, that's way down the road. And uh, statistically, you know, I know when you talk to a group of college kids, you know, I had 30 in a class, you might have one or two people that will really follow up on it. That's just human nature. Not everybody's going to do that. Not everybody's wired that way. Um, but right. that's, uh, you know, that is uh, eventually the, the light will, will come on. And a lot of times it's somewhere right around age 40 or so people start <laughs> thinking about, you know, I need to think about retirement. So right. that's, that's I, the way I, to do it. Yeah, and I think that's kind of why we're having these webinars and this education too, so that people could start thinking about it even earlier. Because the early, like you said, the younger you are and you start saving, the better off you are, right? If you start at a younger age. So um, I just wanted to also remind our audience we'll have a QA function. If you have any questions for Dr. Ed, um, Professor Ed to answer that you have, please put it in the QA section and we'll get to it. So I just wanted to go um, another. I know we've been we've been talking about you know how to how to start off and steps to take. One question that looms or keeps coming up is or is having debt a bad thing? Um, is it a bad? Is a goal to have zero debt? Okay, so so that question is debt bad. Um, I you know there's going to be different people have different opinions about it. And I'm just mm -hmm. going to tell you what my opinion is, but um, of course debt is, is very dangerous thing, <laughs> but I, there are some people that say have no debt at all. Um, you know, for me, I think there's a couple of things that I would say um, are reasonable to have some debt. One of them is a house. It, it, it by the time you save up, you know, in LA, if, you know, how long will it take you to save up $500,000 for a house? Well, you'll never right. get there. You're going to have to have a loan of some kind. Mm -hmm. So, and you're going to pay something for housing anyway. So I say, you know, having a reasonable amount of debt for a house, um, I think it, if it's, it's one third usually of your um, discretionary income, whatever you have, I, I don't think that's unreasonable. You're, mm -hmm. you're going to pay somebody, uh, you might as well buy your house yourself. And that's often over a period of time, you'll pay it off and that will become your biggest asset. And that's something right. at some point you might sell and downsize that my wife and I were fortunate. We're a little bit, you know, we're older than um, most of the people probably listening to this. And so we were able to buy real estate when it was still affordable. And mm -hmm. then as real estate went up, we could sell it and buy something and we were working. It's a little bit different now because it's really out of reach for a lot of people coming right out of college right. or even middle aged. Uh, if you don't have a house already, I, I know a lot of people um, in their 40 and they haven't been able to have a house just because the cost of housing has gone up so much. So yeah, debt for a house. I say debt for an education, I think reasonable debt if if for me if it increases your earning capacity i think you can go into debt for maybe the the no more than the cost of a of a moderate car it is if if you, if i go into twenty thousand dollars debt over four years and i'm able to um, earn a lot more money then it's a it's a good thing now i used to i used to ask the the college freshman i'd say how much are you worth? And I'd say, now in God's eyes, you know, you're, you can't put a price on what you're worth, but everybody else thinks you're worth $20 an hour. And that's it. Cause mm -hmm. everybody, if, if we pay you $20 an hour, you'll come work all day for us. So that's what you're worth. Now, if you get a college education, now you should be worth $30 an hour and, and, and going on up. So that's what an education is for. Right. Um, now, debt for a car, reasonable debt for a car, if it's going to be a, re it, you know, car is an expense. Um, and so you're, if you get a used car, you're, you're going to do it in repairs. If you get a new car, you have a payment. For me, I always like to have a relatively new car that had a, um, a good, um, um, you know, Miley. it was going to be reliable and yeah. it had some, some type of a warranty with it. And um, I always drove modest cars. I, I don't have expensive cars, but if you can afford an expensive car, that's fine. But as long as you can still save, 
whatever you can afford. So for me, a little bit of debt is is okay. My wife, she does, she likes no debt. So <laughs> when you get older, you don't want to have debt. But when you're when you're building your wealth, you probably have to have some. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm the same way too. I like zero debt too because I don't like to owe anybody. But no, <laughs> definitely <laughs> you don't want to have credit card debt. That kills right. you. And uh, that's one of the questions that people ask. Say, well, okay, I have credit card debt, and should I? pay off my credit cards first before I start my savings because I'm only getting 7% on my savings and the credit cards would cost me this. And this is another thing that, you know, I'm going to differ with some people. And just my own opinion is I say start savings and then start working on your, on your debt. But mm -hmm. if you wait sometimes until you pay off your credit cards, you never get started and you have to have something working for you. Right. Um, so, you know, I just say, um, you know, Get started Both. savings right away and then, then attack your debt. Awesome. Thank you for that word of wisdom. Um, hopefully, I'm taking notes too, and I hope audiences also as well. Um, we have some more questions that are coming in. Um, I'm going to take this one. Um, the question said, is it a good idea to use CDs as a way to invest your money? Or what advice can one invest his money that would yield? What can you invest your money in that would yield a good a good profit for you in order to be successful? You know, this is where I wish I didn't, I didn't prepare a slide on this. And, and I was thinking about that. I should have. But if you could think of uh, your investment as a triangle, okay? So you've got this triangle. And on the bottom is the base. It's, it's the biggest part. And depending your age, but let's say you've got 50% of all of your savings, I would go in that bottom part of the triangle. And that's going to be somewhere very, very secure, very safe. And you're talking about, um, you know, I don't know what CDs pay now, but they, they've been traditionally, um, you know, paid three to five, 6%. Now they're coming back up. So they might be, I don't even know, two or 3% now, but for a long time, they were zero. But, you know, CDs, T-bills, um, very, very, uh, say low yield, but maybe five to 7% type of thing. So I've got to put half my money there in the middle of it. I'm going to put something that's more, maybe can grow a little bit more. The stock market goes up and down, but if I'm going to stay in it for 40 years, um, I'm probably going to go to with a, I'm going to go with some fund because I'm not a stock broker. I don't follow the stock market and try and play, you know, which one's going up and down. I would put it, you know, with somebody like Vanguard or Fidelity or Tia Kref or somebody, they diversify my funds and they're going to get probably from seven to 12% on about 40% of my money. And then I take 10% and that, if I have something that comes up, I think has a lot of really good potential to it. I might go with that one if it has, um, you know, if it has really good potential, maybe it's a um, opportunity to uh, make a secure loan or something like that, maybe get 10 or 12% interest um, in myself. I had a lot of business opportunities because I was a, a, I'm a lawyer. And so I would see people that were especially students. A lot of times they would start businesses and I would invest with them, but I kept that down to, you know, about 10%. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of have a blend and overall you want to end up with seven or 8% per year that you're not that without a lot of risk. Right. Thank you for that. I hope that answers the question. That was very eye-opening. Um, Dr. Ed, I wanted to ask you um, a personal question. Um, how young were you when you started your path to um, you know, financial independence and um, success, being successful in your finances. Just a personal question. If you, if you're okay with sharing, <laughs> yeah, I'll be, I'll be glad to share. So I'll say, do as I, as I say, not as I do. Okay, <laughs> um, I, I'm much more of a risk taker than my wife. Okay, I've always owned my own businesses. Um, mm -hmm. I, when I was uh, 17 years of age, I owned a swimming school. My dad, I had talked my dad into building a pool and a lot next to our house. I ran it the whole time I was, um, I had a business in, in during, put myself through college and my sisters. And so 
I was always hustling, doing something like that. So mm -hmm. I've always been entrepreneurial and I've, I've invested in a lot of different things with students and so mm -hmm. on. So, you know, my path has been a lot more where I've invested in people. I, I would knew a lot of students and if they were good people and they were starting a business and I thought it made sense, um, you know, I've owned everything from at one point, uh, I own always a lower percentage, I own 9% of a, um, of a company that grew Kentia Palms. We had a million trees under 20 acres of shade. I've, I've owned, you know, started, a group started up a bank. I, I owned a silkscreen printing company with one of my students for about 15 years. Again, he owned um, 85% of it and I owned 15. Um, you know, those types of things. So I've been a very eclectic investor, but I always, through my employer, I always had an employment. That was my base. Mm -hmm. So I was a, a teacher for nine years. And I, I taught middle school, math and science. I went to law school at night. And during the whole time, they have a teacher's retirement system. So I put into that. Once I started my law practice, I started up what's called a SEP IRA, a um, self-employed individual retirement account. And I put money aside every year for that. And then at the university, when I became there uh, on the faculty and legal council, they had a retirement plan that matched. So I started doing that. So I would have to say I started pretty young. I, I was I was I wasn't even out of high school before when I was starting to do that, but that's kind of the way I was wired, and um, I enjoy doing that. So, yeah, it worked yeah. for me. No, that's inspirational, and um, I, you know, I think uh, like we were we were saying when we when we find out about other ways, other ways, other channels that people use that inspires us. And we look into that and see how we could better grow ourselves. Um, granted, yes, everybody's in a different path, but um, that entrepreneurial spirit, there's something to say about it. <laughs> um, well, you have to understand time. too yeah. that, you know, you don't, you don't get, you don't hit a home run every time you get up the plate. I've lost money too. Well, you I'm just sure. try and limit your losses as much right. as you can. And uh, I, I kind of look at it like in in baseball, you know, if if you get up 10 times in baseball and you only get three hits and you get out seven times, that puts you in the Hall of Fame. So you don't have to you don't have to win every time. Mm -hmm. You just have to win more than you lose in investing. And you have to avoid taking huge risks that will wipe out all of your money. Right. No, thank you for saying that uh, you don't have to win all the time because some risk is, um, you know, risk taking also involves some losses. So thank, I appreciate you putting that caveat in. Um, so now I want to ask a quick question. Um, so what I know the Bible says, you know, so for yourselves treasures in heaven, um, you know, and you know, we, on the other hand, we are, we, we also want to be successful here as well on, on earth. And I think when we were initially talking, you talked about what your definition of success was, um, <clears throat> how would you say this relates to this verse? Because I know we're Christians, he, this is a seminar, um, webinar also, and we're also in, including that into it. How would you say um, that scripture relates to being successful, a successful failure? Yeah, um, you know, I think, first of all, I think uh, Dr. Agbor and, and people like that who are, are pastors, I think they mm -hmm. do a really good job of explaining that more better than I will, but I'll be glad to share my <laughs> thoughts on that. Um, you know, there's a lot of scriptures that say, don't do not desire to be rich. Uh, Money is the root of all evil. Uh, lay up not for yourself treasures on earth but, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and rust does corrupt thieves cannot break through and steal and that sort of thing and and i take that very seriously um i i think it comes down to your motivation There's, it also says you know to whom much is given much is required right and and even when you're talking about don't lay up treasures uh, on earth, they're saying think ahead. You know, you're thinking think ahead towards heaven. What my my goal was never 
to try and have more money than anybody else or to pile up uh, you know, money that um, you know, more than I need. Um, I just wanted to be able to be generous with people, mm -hmm. to have money to help people, to um, take care. I felt that I had taken responsibility as a husband and a father that I needed to be able to take care of my family. And, um, and I felt that that was entirely scriptural. So right. as long as it doesn't cross into the area of greed, and I understand you can get there. Um, I, I just think there's, uh, it's, God's given us a, a brain and he's given us healthy bodies. And for us to recognize the fact that we're not always going to have healthy bodies. And at some day when they quit working, we're still going to be alive. So what are we going to do? We're planning ahead. That's right. So I, I don't see a big conflict with it unless, unless I really get into the into the area of greed. Of greed. Thank you very much for, um, you know, explaining that as well too. Because a lot of times, you know, people people find those two, you know, things conflicting. Well, I just want to be content or, but at the same time, you brought up something very important. A motivating factor could be to give back, right? Um, not not just for ourselves, but to further the gospel, to, to do things on earth that would help propagate the gospel. And I think that's very important, the giving back and the charity part of it as well. Um, I um, just yeah. Can I add something personal yes. as well? Uh -huh, um, of course. Probably the person that I looked up to the most. I had a very a good family, my dad and so on. But my grandfather never got past the third grade, and he owned a home one time in his life, and then he sold it so he could give the money to his daughter to go to Bible school. Uh, he lived in rented houses. He was a true American cowboy. Uh, he was born in Oklahoma Territory when it was, uh, uh, before it was a state. And uh, he was a true, true cowboy. He was a ranch foreman, but he always lived on the ranch. And, you know, he was that word contentment. He was content with what he had. He mm -hmm. was never rich, but he was content. And he, um, he worked um, and saved some money and he lived very modestly, but he is a person that I looked up to as successful because um, he was content with what he had. He was mm -hmm. happy with where he was at and he didn't have to ask anybody else for some help. Now, if you need help, that's, I'm not saying that's bad if you have to ask for it, but for him, I was always, I was hoping to emulate him mm -hmm. in, in some ways. So, I, so you know, having a lot of money is not the key to, is not the measure of success, but right. Um, yeah. So for me, that was my model. Nice. Thank you for that. Um, so how can, um, what, how can you, we be challenged? What things could we be doing right now to, um, kind of meet our goals or meet where we want to be? Of course, there's, you know, the, the younger people, there's people who are middle age, and then there's the old people who are close to retirement, and there's no um, time that is late, right? We can start now to make a difference, but um, what, what how can we challenge ourselves, or what can we start to do, um, you know, or goals that we have to, you know, write out or start working, or would you say right now? For okay, us? <laughs> well, let Let's talk about the key to success, which I right. say set low goals. Okay, so I, I have a famous picture of Napoleon who was on a, his throne, and it was painted him. He, he crowned himself as emperor of France. And um, so, you know, I always look at this. Well, this guy had pretty lofty goals for himself. Mine are not quite so high. But um, I, I, when we talk about setting goals, what is it we really mean? So if, if I have a shot of a, of a ball going into a net because for me, a goal has to be something that you can know if you made it or not. If you're playing basketball and you shoot at a goal, or if you're playing soccer and you shoot at a goal, if it goes in the net, it's a goal. If it doesn't go in the net, it doesn't. It's something you can measure and you don't have to ask yourself, well, did I make it or not? It either, right. you know, you either did or you didn't. So this is the process I go through, and, and I'm going to walk you through really quick here, and, and maybe somebody will find this helpful, but I think everything starts with the dream. Mm -hmm. So somebody 
dreams are great because you don't have any limitations. You know, you can fly, you can be rich, you can, you can, you know, marry a beautiful person, whatever, you know, dreams, you can do anything. So, you know, if we have something that we allow God to direct us, you know, if we have this dream to be, you know, financially independent. And then I, I think the next step is something that there's an idea. Maybe you hear about some possibility, you go, you know, maybe, maybe I can do that. And you start saying, you know, this person did it. Maybe it works for me. So now you, you kind of go from a dream to an idea. It's a possible dream. Then you come up with a plan and now you start writing this plan down. Okay, what is my plan? My plan is I'm going to start putting money aside and I'm going to start putting it in a retirement account. I'm going to let it grow over a period of years. And, and uh, you know, these are the types of things you're going to do. And um, I say that it's important. Now, the next one, now you're ready to start a goal. A goal is a dream with a deadline. So if you say, hey, I'm going to put $200 a month in a retirement account for three months. Well, after three months, I can find out if I did it or not. I'd say set low goals in that don't put them out too far, make them short enough so that, you know, you can check in on yourself. And so I, I put three months down there. And then maybe if you make it three months, you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try it now for six months. And then maybe you can work yourself up to a year. Um, and I think it's really important to write down your goals. And I'm going to even challenge people today if they think about this they don't have to do it now but over the next few days if you're really serious about wanting to save some money for retirement whatever you define for yourself you say this is how much i i think i can do start somewhere if you can't do 500 dollars a month do 400 if you can't do 200 do 100 if you can't do 100 do 50 start somewhere with that you think you can do most of us can find 50 dollars a month um, you know, between cutting out something or, um, you know, economizing or getting a little extra somewhere or, you know, you, you come up, you, you find a way to do that. But I would say, write it down. I saw some research that said the persons that wrote down their goals, they had a, at the end of the time, they had a 42% better chance of achieving it than people who didn't. And did you, did you know that if you write down your goal and then you share it with a friend and you say, hey, I've decided that I'm going to try and save $200 a month from my first paycheck. I'm going to do that for three months. If you share it with somebody, your chances for success, success go up another 25%. And for me, it's something about writing it. And I don't even know if it's typing it. For me, there's something that goes on between your brain and your head. If you write it out physically, write it down somewhere and um, maybe even put it somewhere where you can see it on a card or something. And then you have what's called, I call vision, which is just your dream in action. So you say, all right, I have to do something now in order to save this money. I need to open up an IRA account. I need to go to my HR department at work and find out, do you have a 401k plan? Do you match it? Or maybe um, I need to up the amount. And another thing that I, another suggestion that I have, there's a couple other ones in how to pay for this. I'll tell you something that I did and, 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 I, and I put this under, don't be a thumb sucker, okay? In other words, uh, if, you, if you have to determine, first of all, that you're going to really consider yourself, to, you're gonna pay yourself first. You know, you're paying rent, you're paying taxes, you're paying everybody else, but, Pay yourself first and, and decide that you're going to do that. Decide you're going to make giving a priority. Um, I do have a, a slide on this that says, just don't be a thumb sucker. And it, it writes it on there. And I'd say another thing you do is you open up an IRA or a 401k account. Um, and, uh, and so when you do that, um, maybe I could get some help with that slide and just put that up there. Thank you. Um, so you open up an IRA account and then what I did is, you know, when you get a raise, I would put half of it into monthly retirement savings. That's how I would increase my re retirement. I found out this, 
I would make a certain amount of money. Let's say I'm making $50,000 a month, $50,000 a year, and now I get a $5,000 raise. So I get a little bit more in my paycheck. I found out six months later, I couldn't even find where that extra $5,000 went. Our lifestyle, we just absorbed it into our lifestyle and, and we, you know, we paid more taxes, whatever. So when I got a $5,000 raise, it's $250. As twenty five hundred dollars is basically, I just put uh, two hundred dollars more. Half of it just went into my retirement account, and, I, and then I would take the other half home. And uh, so that's one way I increased my retirement savings through the years is just doing that. And then um, I would max out my employer matching contribution, making sure if they're giving away money, I wanted to make sure that you know that's that's raising my retirement they're giving it to me and it's not taxable so you're you're really mix mix missing out if you don't max out your matching contribution so those are my suggestions they're not mm -hmm. rocket science it's, it's pretty basic you know yeah Just do those things and and then uh, you know check in see how you do no, thank you. That Those are very, very practical tips. And I like what you said about writing down and writing down your goals. It makes me think of a verse where it says, um, you know, the vision, write it down and make it plain. When you write stuff down, you're more inclined to see it or put it in a place where you could visualize it and, you know, look at those things that you have down and be able to think about them, just have it in your memory constantly and to achieve those goals. Um, you know, I, definitely... I have a story about that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so <clears throat> I had read somewhere that, you know, writing down goals was important. So when my kids were growing up, we used to have, uh, we put a little notebook by our phone. That's when you still mm -hmm. had phones in the house. Yeah. Now everybody's carrying them around their pocket. Cell but phones, Okay. Yeah. And I, I would tell my kids, you know, when we had something that we say, oh, let's, I want to do this. I want to do that. I said, go write it down, write it down next to the phone. So one day my son and I, we were watching a USC football game and they're playing Notre Dame. And we said, man, wouldn't it be fun to go back to Notre Dame sometime and watch, watch USC football? Mm -hmm. We're big fans. And so uh, I said, let's go write it down. So we put it on the, on the phone, in the phone, next to the phone. We wrote it on the list, forgot about it. You know, the next year, Somebody came and, and said, hey, I've got two extra tickets. I'm going back to Notre Dame to go to the USC game. My son was 10 years old. He just mm. turned 40 last week. So he's 10 years old. And you know what? We both said, you know, that's one of our goals. We wrote that down. And do we want to do it or not? If we mm. want to do it, this is our chance. So, you know, we saved a little bit of money and we went back there and had a great time. Yeah. So I don't know if I would have gone if I hadn't written it down. But <laughs> no. um, you know, that's why I kind of convinced myself. I think it's important for me. Yeah, no, it is. I think it's important too. It's always good to have a visual. Um, okay, we're gonna go to the Q and A now. We have some questions in here. Um, is it good to start saving on SSDI or SSI? Um, I'm not sure what those acronyms stand for, but I'm assuming. Um, you probably do know, doctor. Um, are, are, well, I'm, are they, they mean that, are they on disability and they're asking, should they see if they're on disability? Mm, I'm not sure, but the, let's assume that's the case. Okay. Yeah. Or if you're on social security, should you start, I guess maybe if somebody's saying, if they're already on social security, they're mm -hmm. already getting social security, should they start, they start saving? saving? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, I think at that stage, you have what you have, and you probably need to use what you have to live on. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, you try and save more, you, your saving is not so much for your retirement income, as it is for emergencies and for other, other things. So um, I, I think really, um, what I'm talking about are the people that are still working. And, um, you know, if, if you're, um, we all find ourselves in different positions in life. And uh, sometimes people have a lot of things happen to them, illness or whatever. And, um, you know, there's no, there's, I don't believe that um, one person is um, any better than another one, depending on how much money they have or so on. So I would say, you know, if you're on a fixed income, 
you're probably where you're where you're going to be. So. Okay, thank you for that. I hope that answers the question. So, um, Professor Ed, I want to um, kind of ask <clears throat> some questions as well, kind of moving away from you know the challenges and also the steps. What would you say in your experience has been um, an easy way or a less challenge? I mean, everything has challenges and risks, but a less risky way, a challenging way to acquire wealth or to to um, be become more financially independent in your opinion in your um in your experience and what you've been through you have a vast knowledge and experience of you know different industries what would you say what would you advise someone who wanted to start right now and they wanted to make an investment or you know they were thinking of doing some kind of savings what would what would what would you advise them where would you advise them to go Okay, well, what? you know that's mm -hmm. that's a, a kind of an open-ended question. Let me let me share this much though. Mm -hmm. um, as a young attorney, I started off working for a, comp a a law firm, and and we were doing a lot of wills and trusts. So I had an opportunity to sit down with older people mainly and talk to them about you know their plans on who they're going to leave their money to and their families and all this. And I and I was very very curious. Um, to, to, you know, some people, they, they would have the same types of jobs and one person would have a lot of money and another person would, would barely be making it, you know, mm -hmm. and of course, there's a lot of things that can happen in life. Divorce is one thing that, um, you know, kind of you split up everything in half and uh, illnesses, other things you have sometimes bankruptcies or, or there, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ups and downs in life, right? So, mm -hmm. but this is what I, this is what I kind of determined for myself. People do better investing in things they know something about. Okay. So like an engineer who wants to open up a coffee shop, not doesn't usually work, but a barista who wants to open up a coffee shop, you got a better shot at it. That right. engineer, maybe they should stick with somebody who owns a machine shop who wants to get started or something, something that they know. So. I thought to myself, well, what do I know? And there were two things. I knew real estate. I knew something about real estate and I knew students. So I determined when, you know, I would invest with this, with the individual. If I, if this, a lot of times students would come to me because maybe I'm the only lawyer they know and they, they're starting a business or they're, they're buying out their parents' business or something. And if I thought they had a good idea, I would give them $10,000 or $15,000 or something, not huge usually. And I would buy stock in their company. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I would then, they got their salary, they got paid. And then I would get some kind of minority distribution. I usually set a, a, a limit on what they could make as a salary. And then mm -hmm. anything over salary, they kept 90% and I kept 10 my own 10%. So right. I, I invested in students because I knew students and I felt like I knew if they were worked hard, if they were smart, if they were industrious, if they were lazy. I mean, so if, you know, that's the way I kind of did it. Um, so I think sticking with things that you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, if you have a company that's doing well and, and you like what they're doing, you like the management, well then buy their stock. Um, I, I'd prefer to do that as opposed to just something I don't know, or I trust a professional maybe to help me guide me to a group that charges me a reasonable fee, but like a, a larger group that can diversify my portfolio and I don't have to go in and manage it myself. Right. A Fidelity, a Vanguard, a, a Tia Craft, you know, for that basic stuff. Usually they, they manage this thing, the company programs, they, they're all um, you know, managed accounts. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know, I guess I'd say, you know, um, invest in what, you know, and, and, uh, you're better off, um, to do it that way. Yeah, no, I like that. I like the invest in what, you know, cause I mean, that's, that's the only way you can move up, right. Is when you, when you're doing what you love, you never have to walk in your day, work a day in your life, they say, right. So when you're investing in something that you do love or something that you do care about or know about, it makes it a little easier, um, you know, and, and you know, on. most of us don't know a lot about investing. So 
it is smart to go to somebody that you trust and to and to talk to them. They're used to this. They 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 have they know what in, investments are appropriate and so on, and they can help you with that. And uh, I certainly don't give investment advice to people. I'm a lawyer, not a financial advisor. Right. Uh, but I tell them, you know, they should save. Now, what exactly they do save, it's depending on so many different things. And they have to spend a little time with somebody who really knows what they're doing. And they just have to be really conscious of what it's costing them. Uh, you know, the fees can vary quite a bit. But if it's a reasonable fee, um, you know, it's worth it. Thanks. We have another question um, that is, do you have any recommendations on how we could pay off taxes, old taxes? Any old taxes, um, any recommendations for paying those off? Um, I'm assuming this is probably a huge amount of taxes. Yeah. Well, again, it depends. I mean, taxes um, are one of those things that, you know, are, are what there's only things certain life or death and taxes you know so mm -hmm. they will collect those things um this again it it's dependent you usually you can get on some kind of a payment schedule mm -hmm. um and you they even have hardship things that sometimes you qualify for hardship if you're um not able to pay it back there are uh firms that specialize in that and i definitely would get some some help on that professional help if I could. Um, and, but yeah, that's, that's one of the ones you got to pay off. Uh, that that's the, that's the people who can put the most pressure on you. So yeah. you gotta, you probably have to deal with those guys first. And you, you, even if you go through a bankruptcy situation, taxes survive bankruptcies. So, uh, you got to get a lot of a professional advice on that one. Right. Thank you very much for sharing that answer. Um, so I just wanted to um, also talk about again, um, you know, in the young for young people or you know older people alike as well. Um, we know money is not the only measure of reach, um, you know, success. We've talked about that. Um, and in this microwave day and age, especially you know social media age, everybody wants everything now. Everybody sees people, you know getting flashy things and want to be successful all their idea of success is rooted in the things that they see online um how else or uh, what advice would you have for you know somebody who's going through that and seeing and and thinking of how to get money in order to do those things and how can we measure return in that sense or measure our return for for um success in that sense hopefully i made sense with that question sure mm -hmm. you know i was i was really careful when i was a college professor that i i didn't want to be responsible for setting um goals or uh defining success for people, for people i felt right. i felt like as a college professor i was being paid by that student that a lot of them were going into debt to access me uh, the knowledge I had and the contacts I had. So I felt like I was, my job as a college professor was not to teach business law. That was part of my job, but my job was to help them to become successful. However, they define success. Now I, so I don't agree with a lot of times, but if somebody wants to be a millionaire and they come to me and they say, well, this, how do I do it? Well, then I, I I'll tell them the best way that I know how if somebody you know, says that they want to work, become a teacher. Well, then that's a different de definition of success. So, right. you know, for me though, um, I think you start, you start with prayer. You start with asking for God's guidance. Um, somebody said to me one time, you know, I was at one time, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I was a young person and I was kind of just didn't, I, I graduated from college and and I was kind of like, what am I doing next? And um, should I, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I go to graduate school? And, and I, um, I was trying to find direction in my life. And uh, somebody told me this, and I'll never forget it, a guy named Jim Rogers. He was a godly man. And he said, Ed, he goes, if God wants to tell you what to do, he's capable of telling you. He said, so you just need to, you know, make ask for guidance, ask for direction, keep your ears open, 
but then you know fall um, make your plans and says it and if there if god wants to make do something else he'll he'll let you know he's capable and so i felt free to just say you know well what are the things i really enjoy doing and uh, i ended up becoming a teacher i, I enjoyed teaching for nine years um, it so happened that I was able to go to law school. I actually thought I would stay in education as a principal or something. It turned out once I went to law school, I started working for lawyers. I ended up going into law for about 10, 12 years and then became end up going back to the university and becoming a teacher again. So, you know, that's um, that's the way God leads. Eventually, mm -hmm. uh, I think he leads us into the areas that we really have joy and a love for. And so I think we can follow those types of uh, things and, and then ask for God's guidance. But that's where you start off, I think, right. is, is every it, each one of us has to define that. And, Ourselves. and uh, you know, I think that's part of the joy of living is just is seeing how God leads us and where he takes us and the journey that he takes us. It's, it's unique for everybody. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you for that answer. So um, I know some people say, you know, life insurance, you know, there's talks about also life insurance as a way to kind of, um, you know, either pass in a legacy or, or even currently be able to, um, you know, be successful in a sense. Um, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, life insurance as a savings tool? Or is that something that you, you know, have, have yeah. um, personal yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're asking a lawyer uh, a financial question. So I'm going to give you my personal, <laughs> this is me personally. This is not, that doesn't mean that anybody else has to follow this, but yeah. Just you know, your thoughts. <laughs> I mean, okay. I think, I think you have to have some levels of, of insurance. So if, mm -hmm. you know, when my kids were growing, when my kids were at home, if something happened to me, they, I had to have something to replace my income I, I, and so on. So I always had some some insurance and I always had the type of insurance that had some kind of value, uh, uh, you know, that had it had some residual value. You can get term life insurance and there, there's, you know, if you if you're disciplined and you buy term insurance and then you save a little money, then you invest the difference. That works really well for me. Um, I just would always, I had some really good advice from some people I really trusted in the life insurance field and they, they guided me. And you know what, after I retired, I was surprised at how much that had accumulated in value. It was, it was surprising. So um, yeah, I think for me, um, you know, I was never uh, all usually one way or the other, but Generally speaking, I would get the ones that had some, um, you know, some some value added to it, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, I I felt like I wasn't part of my premium was going to being saved, and and eventually I cashed them in after I uh, after I retired, and so yeah, it yeah. worked for me. No, that's awesome. Thank you so much, um, Professor Ed. We're learning a lot um, from your the steps, especially that we need to take, um, you know, to to get into to being successful or to having some kind of financial um, elevation in a sense. Um, I know, you know, for those who are also joining some of the things that you touched on with starting with something that you know, you know, doing something that you know is, you know, looking into things that you know, taking, you know, investing or you know whatever whatever financial um aspect that you could help you there and also i know you talked about writing down what your goal is setting those low goals writing them down and making sure that they're goals that are achievable for wherever you are at every at the point that you are and not to be afraid to start small right i mean yes we want to get um to a certain goal but start where you are and continue to make those little, you know, goals and steps until you're able to even add more. So definitely um, a lot of, a lot of gems being dropped and we appreciate your time here with us. Just want to remind the audience again, we still have our Q&A um, option. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in here for Professor Ed. Um, so one question that comes up in the, in the Q&A right now, and um, it says, how can we diversify? What, are, what is the best way for us to diversify our investments for safer returns, specifically 
in the older age. Um, when we're getting older, how can we diversify our returns um, for safer returns? Safe, because um, when we're we're older, it's you know it's kind of hard to be risky. Right. Um, but yeah. So. Right. Well, you know, everybody has risk tolerance, yeah. different levels. Um, I, like I said, I was always um, very entrepreneurial. I had my own businesses and I, you know, for me, um, I would be willing to try small amounts uh, on things. And uh, so, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm maybe a little bit more risk. Um, part of it is that, you know, I always felt like I, I always had capacity to earn it back. So, but when I get older, I can't do that anymore. So one thing you have to really avoid is, is signing on to debt. If you, you know, when you're signing on debts, you, you, if you sign a loan to go out and start a business or something like that, that's very risky. So, you know, when you get, when you're younger, maybe you can do that, but you got to make sure that business is going to go. Cause if you sign up for a debt, and, uh, you know, it doesn't go, the debt's going to stay with you. So, um, you know, I, I have just, um, I'm, believe me, I, I'm very, very much believe in, in different income streams. So that's why I would have all these different businesses that I right. would give somebody something here and something there. And I might get a little bit coming and going. And I felt if one dried up, then the other one's still going to go. Um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't putting millions in different things. I'm talking about, you know, relatively uh, minor investments or loans um, that loans with people. I've, I've loaned people money that I haven't gotten back, but I, but I'd make it a, a practice that I never loan money out that I'm not willing to lose if they don't pay me back. So I'm saying, well, they asked me for a loan. I said, well, it's to myself. Well, if they don't pay me back, what can I afford to lose if they never pay me back? You know, right. and I, make, I try and make sure that they can pay me back, but I'm prepared that if this thing doesn't work, that I'm not getting it. I don't want to rely on it. And then all of a sudden it's not there because right. sometimes things happen. So diversifying, you know, I, you know, like I say, if you go to a, a, a financial planner, well, you know, they help you with that diversification on the stock market side of things. I really don't know anything about the stock market, except I hire people that do. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, now, real estate, if, you know, there's some people, if you own your home, I tell you one thing I would be looking to do right now is uh, I would be building one of these ADU, these, uh, these uh, units in the backyard. They, they allow them right now. That's going to be an additional income source and it's going to increase the value of your property. And, um, you know, if you can afford to do that, it's, it's even worth a little bit of a, of a going into debt to build that. If you can now, rents are high, you can build it as long as the rent is more than the, than the cost of the loan. Uh, that's definitely, a, I think, a really good way to do that. There's there's no free lunch. You have somebody living in your backyard and sometimes they don't pay your rent and sometimes they play the music too loud and, you know, mm -hmm. you have to, the plumbing breaks. I mean, so there's, it's not free, but it, you can control it a lot easier and you can control who goes in there and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I would, I would say if you can get into some different segments like that and you got to be really careful with loans, you have to be careful with, people um, who want to start their own businesses. You want to make sure that they have more at risk than you do. I always, you know, want to have the, the person in the same boat with me. I want the captain in the same boat as me. If the boat goes down, he's going down too. Um, I don't want him to take my money. Oh, I've got a great idea. This is a great investment. And I say, well, how much do you have in it? Well, I don't have anything in it. Well, if it's such a great idea, then why aren't you putting your money there? You know, right. So I'm never, I never invest for in something somebody else isn't invested in. And I never ask anybody to invest with me unless I'm invested in it. Right. That's good. I mean, <laughs> that's a, that's a good answer and a good plan, but you mentioned something about um, real estate. And speaking of real estate too, you know, getting property and acquiring property, you know, a lot of people kind of tell you, you know, that for you to, you know, be successful or in order for you to, you know, 
you know, financially be this or that, you need property. You can do without acquiring property. Is that something that you would say is true? Um, and if it is, um, how, how would one go about doing that? Starting to invest in real estate or, you know? Yeah, but this is, this is where we, you have to be very honest with yourself. Yeah. Um, okay. It's actually, um, it, traditionally, I would have said, yeah, that's the American dream, own your own house, all that kind of thing. Right now, the cost of housing is so high and, you know, it ties up so much capital. When you start getting housing costs that even for a starter home, you're talking about $600,000, well, you need 20% of that. So you're, you're going to have to have $120,000 cash in order to get into a house a lot of times. And then you have, you know, um, high interest rates. I, I don't think 6% is so high right now. It's high compared to what it was. But, but when I, I bought my first home, my first mortgage uh, interest rate was 12%. That was in, in the mid 70s. So we were having, you know, a, a recession or inflationary time. I, I had my first home was my first home only cost, I think, uh, $54,000. So, you know, it made a difference. But of course, now it, it's just completely out of whack. So if you're going to own property, you might realistically need to think about owning it out of state or even living out of state. Um this metropolitan, you have to make quite a bit of money if you want to buy any real estate here. I think it's a good investment long term if you can swing it, but um, you have to have a pretty good job to do it, uh, you know, to get to be able to carry the kind of payments. And that's why I have nieces that have moved to Texas and I have some that have moved other places. And you just have to be realistic and say, uh, you know, what's am I going to be able to buy a house here? And uh, that's that's a tough decision for young people and that's too bad. Yeah, and um, yeah, what you just said about everybody moving, everybody's moving to Texas, everything's bigger there. <laughs> well, so, and also, um, you know, we do have a generation yeah. like myself that, you know, there's gonna be a lot of wealth transfer. So, right. you know, a lot of times parents are in a different position. Now, if mm -hmm. they've owned their home for a long time, then they pass it on to the kids and or they can give them loans and so on. So a lot of times younger people are going to need some help from their parents, much more so than even when I was coming up because um, just the way the economics are, but um, you know, families can work together for that. I think it, you look at it sometimes almost like a, a family uh, investment to say, all right, this is how we're going to do to, to make sure that we do that. There, there's a lot of advantages of owning a home besides tax. They can't, you know, if you have a fixed mortgage, they can't raise the rent on you. Your mortgage is the same. So you, you have some stability for kids in school. You know, somebody can't come in and say, hey, you know, move out. I'm, I'm going to sell the house or did this or that. So, yeah, I mean, if you can, if you can get into that or uh, a, a rent to own situation or something like that, um, things go in cycles and right now it's always it's been a a seller's market for a long time but you know if history teaches us anything it's that <clears throat> what goes up must come down and there will be a time um cash is king in when you have inflationary times if you can save onto some cash and <clears throat> when housing prices come down when there is a housing readjustment then if the people that have some cash are going to be able to, to be doing some things that people that haven't saved, even sometimes 20 or $30,000 can make a huge difference. Um, so yeah, I mean, cash is king. So I agree with you, you completely, um, Professor Ed. <laughs> I agree completely. So we're almost um, getting down to, to the wire here. And um, if we have any other questions, please put it in the chat for Professor Ed, um, we've been having a really great time with you today and getting a lot of information and a lot of um, <clears throat> gems from this webinar. Um, I just wanted to um, ask um, Professor Ed, is there anything that you would like to share that we haven't covered or we haven't asked about that you, you're, it's very pressing on your heart 
to let us know today to either the young, the middle age, or the grown um, folks who are watching this and live streaming on Facebook as well? Well, you know, I, there's one of my favorite verses. It's Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. It says, now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Um, you know, God is able to do, uh, there's, is, there's no shortage with him. And, and he's able to provide our needs. And um, I think we have a part in that. But I, I just think that, you know, as Christians, we don't have to operate on the same fear basis as, you know, I don't have this, what's going to happen to me? I think we know we're secure, um, that we're children of God. And I, I, I don't, I'm not saying that, that that's a magic thing that, that you're going to just be successful and you're never going to have a financial problem. We all know great Christians that have financial problems. That's not it. But I'm just saying, you know, God can see us through. And, and if we ask for his help and his guidance, he can do exceeding abundant above all that we ask or think. And uh, so, you know, I've always, I've always felt as though um, as Christians that we need to be very optimistic about our future uh, and, and thankful and grateful. So, um, and I, you know, I'm very, I very much appreciate being asked to come and, and speak here. And that fact that uh, Dr. Agbor is a, I'm a big fan of his. He, he and I taught together at Vanguard University and he's a great addition to our faculty and a very wise and educated person. And so, and uh, you know, the fact he would ask me to do this was a big compliment for me and I appreciate it very much. I think, are you on the, I don't hear your voice. Oh, I'm sorry. I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Ed, um, for that, sharing that. We're not letting you go yet, though. There's one last question okay. that's in the, in the panel here, and it's about how how do we go about investing in real estate again? It's, it's what is your suggestion about investing in real estate investment trust? That's what the question said. Yeah. Okay, so you know one of the one of the problems with real with real estate traditionally is that it takes a lot of capital. It ties up. You know, you have to have twenty percent. So a real estate investment trust is a vehicle that you can put it into, and they pool everybody's money, and then they buy they buy real estate usually in different classes. Some REITs they buy real estate investment trust is a REIT, R E I T. So that some of them buy medical properties. Some of them buy warehouses some of them buy you know um hotels i mean so you kind of go with that traditionally um if you want to get into the real estate market and you don't have a lot of money that is one way that you can diversify and your financial planner can give you some options for that um traditionally they they don't pay a huge um return on a monthly basis uh, in other words, I think they probably five or six percent is usually what you get for those. But mm -hmm. then if they increase in value, then you get that. If it decreases in value, then if you sell it, it's it's not as much. But really, you're buying an income stream. And so I think uh, I think that's a good good thing to do. I think to diversify through the different segments of the economy, real estate, some stocks in the energy section, in the tech section, in you know the hospitality. You you, they, that's what a, a mutual fund would do. And a REIT usually does the same thing. So, Awesome. Thank you so much for answering that question. So we're launching a poll right now um, on the webinar. We would like for everybody to participate in this. It should be, it should appear on your screen right now. Just click and um, submit. And while everybody's doing that, <clears throat> we'd just like to thank again, Professor Ed Westbrook for gracing us with your presence today in this webinar and for answering all the questions that we had. Um, we'll also like to thank our WMCF family, World Missions Christian Fellowship in Torrance, who are also here present, um, the Black Fellowship of So-Called Network of Assemblies of God and any members of their congregation who are joining us as well. 
Um, we'll also like to thank any Vanguard University students who are also present. And thank you all for, for joining us and um, being a part of this webinar today. Um, so we done with the polling. So the polling is still going on. Okay, okay. awesome. And I'd like to invite our pastor, <laughs> Pastor Julius Abor, Dr. Pastor Julius Abor, to, to um, come on and um, close us off here. Thank you. Uh, not, not yet closing. Uh, this is very exciting. Uh, <laughs> thank, I want to say, first of all, thank you so much to Ed for putting tremendous amount of time to towards this. Uh, he usually gives a lecture to graduating seniors at Vanguard on this same topic, but um, what we got tonight is significantly higher uh, and more in terms of uh, depth and meat than what he usually presents to uh, graduating seniors at Vanguard. And we know that this has taken him a lot of time out of his schedule. He's doing this pro bono. Uh, he's not been paid. Uh, and so I just wanted to to uh, to acknowledge that and thank him so very much for continuing to invest in 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 the next generation. Thank you so much, Ed. And um, I want to thank all those who came uh, came in. Um, I wanted to know that this, the webinar started at five p.m. and uh, we are we started recording it. And and uh, so just in case, due to different challenges, you only met us halfway or towards the mm -hmm. end. Uh, the recording will be made available uh, to all members of our church and to uh, the, the so-called Black ne Network, uh, so-called, the yeah, Black yeah. Network, Network of the so-called Assemblies of God. Um, mm -hmm. We will share the recorded link to you people. I want to uh, suggest, and it's just a suggestion, uh, we can all make our choices as we learned tonight that the difference between millionaires and those who are not millionaires is only in choices they make. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I want to always uh, recommend that um, um, you lose nothing getting more information, especially if the information is accurate and useful like this one. Make some time and go through the material. I know you came late, but you will have access to the recording from the beginning. Uh, so I want to, that's what I want to uh, say. I'm very, very grateful for what we have learned tonight. I've made a lot of notes. The chat room there had several things. I was taking notes um, and I will begin to apply, hopefully uh, talk to a financial advisor again, a planner, and see what are the options for diversifying and entering into REITs and mutual funds and things like that. So thank you, Ed, and thank you to moderator. Go back to you, back uh, moderator, to tell us the results of the poll and Ed's closing remark, and then we go from there. I, I need I need to say something too. Um, Ada, thank you. You you were asking me great questions and mm -hmm. uh, made it easier for me. I'm not a high tech person, so I appreciate you uh, you very much, and thank you. No, thank you very much, um, Professor Ed. Um, so do we have the poll, oh, poll ending soon? It's not, okay, here we go. Okay, so um, how to be a uh, successful failure. Let me read up the polls. Did you gain some meaningful insights from this webinar? Absolutely, 82%. Good, a lot of good stuff I need to watch again, 18%. Um, what things did you learn today that you could put into practice, set achievable goals and write them down? 88%, give 10%, save 10%, live on 80, 82% of the people. Pay yourself first, always put a percentage of your income, 82%. Um, Make a plan to achieve your dream, 76%. Set a deadline for your goal, 33% of the people thought that was good. Okay, how can I invest in my financial success? Stick to what you know, invest in what you're familiar with. 71%, good. Start now, the earlier the better, 53%. Put your dreams into action one small step at a time. We have 65%. Ask God for guidance. He can lead you to the right thing, 71%. And talk to professionals, 24%. Number four, did you gain an understanding of some things you could do to become successful financially? Yes, 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 65%. Oh my God, so many great tips, still digesting 
So I think it's safe to say that this webinar was very helpful to a lot of the folks who did the poll today. So again, we really appreciate you, um, Professor Ed, for coming through and for giving us all these tidbits of wisdom that we digested today. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.